allow me for you to add a prayer list. Um, my sister texted me um, Wednesday a picture of her face and a picture of her arm. Um, she had a purple eye that was swollen shut and, and um, clean. Yes, yeah, thank you. On her arm. She had. <laughs> so funny. And with the caption, it's not funny that she said, but um, with the caption, exercise is going to kill me. <laughs> so she, um, she fell walking. Her husband had taken her father-in-law, his doctor, and while they were gone, she thought, oh, let's just go out and get some, get some exercise. And she did, and she fell. And she broke her elbow, and she had the blood kind of I mean, it, it's almost comical. She said, I can't, I said, how's your face? She said, oh, just got an eye, can't, can't see out of it. She's swollen, you know, like that. Well, the funny part is, is and it's none of it's funny. Well, it, um, it usually happens to me at the funny part. Um, but she goes on a trip, a hiking trip, so she was trying to get healthy so she could go on her trip and not die and then wait hike. <laughs> they leave on the 31st, her, her daughter, her husband, and then the, uh, the mother-in-law. So <laughs> I was supposed to go. And she says, well, maybe you can go if I can't go. I said, I can't go. <laughs> I gotta work. But anyway, the doctor told her she'd be fine to go on this trip, that she only has to wear her cast probably three weeks. I'm like, I had to wear my cast when I broke my wrist for six weeks. Something not, is not fair about this whole thing to me. She's going to be fine. But do remember her in your prayers. Her name is Melody Edge. She has been playing an offertory music for us. She recorded a lot of uh, music for us that played in the offertory. So. Um, the song I'm going to sing is In the Presence of Jehovah. I haven't sang it in a very, very long time. And I hope it's not out of my room. So here it goes.
Christ is sitting at Hobo. The Bible says that when two or more are gathered, he is there. So thank you for that. If you have your Bible with you, we've been in uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel, written 600 B.C. by Daniel, who is an exile. Back in chapter 1, we found out, and like I said, this is a very familiar story to folks who grew up in church, but those that maybe haven't studied Daniel a lot, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians went and besieged the Israelites, Judah, and brought all of, a lot of those guys, a lot of those Israelites to to Babylon to be repatriated. That was in chapter 1. Chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Daniel interpreted it because God had given him ability to do so. And the interpretation of that dream was this. Kingdoms will rise and fall, but there's a kingdom coming that will not end. And that was just Jesus Christ, of course, we, we talked about that. And last week, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, feeling pretty good about himself, built him a 90-foot tower and Got him a big a pizza oven going. Said, look here, y'all fall down and worship this thing and worship me or I'm going to put you in that oven. And our boy said, no, we ain't going in there because we don't worship anything but the God of Israel. Whether he saves us or not, we're not going in there. And he talked about obedience last week. And this week, Daniel chapter 4, the most unique chapter of, the most unique chapter in the Bible. Let me tell you why. This Daniel chapter 4 was composed and comes from the perspective of a pagan, the only chapter in the Bible that was composed, Daniel recorded it, but it's Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, a pagan king's testimony. If I, if I asked you today, said, all right, each one of you are going to come up here to the microphone here, and you're going to tell us, give us your testimony. When, what were the circumstances surrounding how and when and who shared. When did you come to faith in Jesus Christ? When did you humble yourself? Anybody give their testimony? That would be cool. We might see testimony times at church. You could heard somebody's testimony. Well, guess what, y'all? This is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. So look at Daniel chapter 4. I'll just be reading here a little bit and then we'll talk about it. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, men of every language who live in the world, May you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. Now right at the very beginning, we find out that he has humbled himself. Name of the sermon today, humble yourself. He's humbled himself and turned towards heaven, and now he believes in the Most High God, and he's praising him right at the very beginning. And then as we get into it, we'll, he'll tell you how, he'll, this is how I got here. Now watch this. How great are his signs in verse 3. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, content and prosperous. Feeling good about myself. I had a dream. There's another one of those dreams you got me right in chapter 2. I had a dream that made me afraid. I was lying in my bed and the images and visions that passed through my head terrified me. Verse 6. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought in to interpret the dream. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and writers came, I told them the dream, so they could not interpret it for me. Finally, I remembered Daniel. Hey, uh, there's about 30 years from chapter 3 to chapter 4, but Daniel had been put in, in charge of a large portion of his kingdom, so he remembered Daniel. Don't know how much day-to-day -day contact they had, but finally Daniel came into the presence. This is verse 8. and told him he is called Belteshazzar. That's the name that Nebuchadnezzar gave him. Verse 9, I said, Belteshazzar is Daniel. Chief of magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Now this is, now remember, he was praising him earlier. Now he's giving his testimony. He's using the little G gods in, in his testimony. And no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream interpreted for me. Here's the dream. We're going to get into it. These are the visions I saw lying in my bed, verse 10. I looked, and therefore before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top reached all the way to the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful. Its fruit was abundant, and on was food for all. Under it, the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. And from it, every creature was fed. Verse 13, in the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger. 
or some translations are angels. A holy one from God coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the animals flee from under it, and let the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. <clears throat> let him, now we've, we've gone from a tree to a person, important. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him live with the animals among the plants on the earth. Let his mind be changed to that, from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal, till seven times pass by. Verse 17. This decision is announced by the messenger or the angel. The holy ones declare the birth, so that the living may know that the Most High, this is important for us, is sovereign over the kingdoms of men, and gives to them any gives to them anyone he wishes, and sets over them the lowliest of men. Verse 18. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now Belteshazzar, tell me what it means. Interesting dream, isn't it? Um, it's, in, it, it's important, guys, for us to realize as we study in the Old Testament. Sometimes we have two the two questions I want to ask. I want you to ask yourself when you're studying in the Old Testament. This is what I do: Where is Jesus Christ in this? And what is the Holy Spirit trying to teach me through this? Now, remember, the Bible is a book about Jesus. In the Old Testament, He's predicted. In the Gospels, He's revealed. In the Acts, he's proclaimed. In the letters, he's explained. And in Revelation, he's expected. So the question should always be, where is Jesus Christ in this? And what is the Holy Spirit trying to teach me through it? When, when we come to Christ in childlike faith, he saves us. It's important as we move on. So that we can fulfill the purpose for which he created us so that his kingdom will be advanced. Jesus Christ. When we humble ourselves, if you'll look there, the, the title of the sermon today is Humble Yourself. When we humble ourselves before Jesus Christ, he, the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and changes us. He changes us and then He starts to instruct us. When you come to a little rusty venue like this, we open up Daniel chapter 4, He's instructing us through the power of His Holy Spirit. He's giving us a new worldview. We've talked a lot about worldviews in the last few weeks. How, how do I fit in the world and how does my life and my death, what has my life and my death got to do with this world? Faith in Christ is the only place we find an answer. This is important, y'all. The only place we find an answer, Nebuchadnezzar finds it later, the only place we find an answer to this question of who I am in, in my life and what happens to me in my death is through faith in Christ. Paul put it this way, I no longer live. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but He lives in me. The life I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. John said in 11.25, I am the resurrection and the life. No one who believes in me, the one who believes in me will live even though he, what? Dies. So this worldview, why should we humble ourselves before the mighty God, the man of God? Why would we should be humble ourselves and accept Jesus Christ. The ultimate purpose of our salvation is for us to fulfill the purpose Christ created us for. So as we're asking ourselves in Daniel today, Holy Spirit, show me, show me through Daniel what you want me to know. Show me through Daniel what will help me be what you call me to be. So the overarching theme of Daniel, written by Daniel 600 BC, is he's writing it to the exiles in this country of Babylon, and he's saying this, God of heaven and earth is in control of all things. This is the thing. God is in control. Nothing happens in the world except through him and by him and according to his will. As we read today, Nebuchadnezzar starts off chapter 4 by praising God. He's seen that God do a lot of amazing things. He saw 30 years ago, remember what he saw? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking around in the fire. So Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Now, I don't know why he does this. I don't know if y'all remember from chapter 2, but when he has these dreams, he calls in these guys, these magicians and enchanters and astrologers and Chaldeans and all these wise men, and they come walking in, and I can't help but hear the Jeopardy thing in my head. They say, walk in, you know, da, 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 da. 
Here they come. They walk walking in. He tells them the dream, and they always say the same thing to him. What is this? What do they say to him every time he tells them? We don't know. <laughs> and so Nebuchadnezzar remembered Daniel. He spoke to Daniel. He said, Daniel. He calls him Belteshazzar. That's the name he was given him to Daniel. Here's the dream. I come, so I commanded the wise men of Babylon. They couldn't interpret it, so he calls a press conference. And he calls Daniel, so Nebuchadnezzar remembers Daniel and calls his main man for this reason. Remember, I don't know if you remember back in chapter 1. Back in chapter 1, verse 17. Remember, God had given Daniel ability to understand dreams and visions. So, let's get into this dream a minute. What has this dream got to do with me? Important, okay? Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel the dream. Where is Jesus in this? So the dream basically is there's this huge tree in the in Nebuchadnezzar sees this huge tree, and it's the biggest tree in the world, and everybody can see this tree, and in the in the branches are all the birds of the, of the air, and underneath are all the beasts of the field. If this leaves were beautiful, it fed everyone, its branches sheltered all the living creatures. Then an angel, and some translations say angel, then I saw a messenger coming from heaven, crying out with a loud voice. Cut down the tree, but leave the stump. That remember we said it, it went from, as we were studying, it went from a tree to a man. That's going to be important later. Leave the stump. So Daniel in verse 17 said, the decision is announced by the messengers. This is why Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. This is what, the, in verse 17, the decision announced by the manager is the Holy One declares the verdict, so that living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives to them anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. This is going to be important in a minute. I'll give you a sneak preview. Nebuchadnezzar, if you don't humble yourself before me, I'm going to make you like an animal. We'll see that in just a minute. That's a little sneak preview. So that you will know who's in control here. And I couldn't help, I couldn't help but remember when he said, when it says here in verse 17 of chapter 4, he gives to them anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. I couldn't help but remember when Jesus Christ stood up in Mark chapter 1 and said, the kingdom of heaven is near, repent and believe. And then he would go out he would go out and display his power over all the all the, the resources of the world, and they would they would say, "Who is this that the wind and the wave obey him?" Because he was a lowly person, the most high sovereign over all the affairs of men. Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel to interpret the dream. Look at verse 19. And then Daniel was greatly perplexed. This is an interesting part of humanity. You look at this. Look at verse 19 now. We're on verse 19. Then Daniel also was greatly perplexed at the time he thought his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, remember that's Daniel's name, do not let the dream or its meaning, meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. And here's a weird, this is the strange part of Daniel chapter 4, is Nebuchadnezzar is now comforting Daniel. <laughs> he said, just tell me what it means. Daniel said, you don't want to know what it means. You don't want to know. It's easy for you to say you want to know what it means. I don't want to tell you. Because, to bring you, if you don't humble yourself, God's going to make you like a cow. I mean, that's what's coming, y'all. It's wild, baby. Hey, Daniel, that's easy for you to say. Nebuchadnezzar was counseling Daniel. And Daniel finally reluctantly said, okay, you want it? Here it comes. I'm going to interpret this dream for you. He tells Nebuchadnezzar that the tree is you and your kingdom. And that holy messenger you saw in your dream, that's an angel from heaven. He has come down and laid down this decree that the tree will be cut down. Y'all remember what in Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, he said when he had his dream, he'd been kind of walking around up on the thing looking at all this stuff. You know? <laughs> Hey, I'm going to take a little nap on this couch here because i got it going on, baby. Look at my place, right? But this tree is going to be cut down. In other words, God's going to break him down. 
probably had to happen to you too, if you're all being honest. We all had to be broken down. Because see, you don't come to Jesus Christ like this. You come to Jesus Christ crawling on your, on your belly. And you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. I've been running away from you my whole life. I humble myself before you. Let's see what happens with the dead. Tells Nebuchadnezzar, the tree is you. This holy messenger is coming to cut you down. Your kingdom will come to an end. Look at verse 24. Now look at Daniel 24. It's getting good now. I'm getting kind of excited. This is the interpretation. Your majesty. This is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by. In other words, for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar, you will be out there eating grass. Okay? Seven times will pass by until you, look at verse 25. You got your Bible with you. Seven times will pass by until you acknowledge what's the name of the sermon today? Humble yourself until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth. In other words, dude, you got this because He gave it to you. Quit walking around like you're some kind of big deal. Look at verse 26. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you what? Acknowledge. Now look at verse 26. When you acknowledge that heaven rules. Verse 27. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. <laughs> Daniel said, look here, I got some advice for you. Now, I ain't trying to tell you what to do. But this don't sound good. I mean, this don't sound good, dude. I mean, you're going to go from living up here to eating grass, okay? Let me give you some advice. I got some advice for y'all. Look at this. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by doing kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Now, it's important to understand what Daniel is not saying. Daniel was not saying that righteousness bring salvation. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is this, Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, for it is by grace you have been saved. I turn and acknowledge you, you saved me by your grace. Through faith, it's a gift, not by work, so that no man can boast, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he has prepared when? in advance for us to do. See, he's not saying, Daniel's not saying that you just, all of a sudden you're going to be righteous by how you act. Paul put it this way in Acts 26, 20. First, to, to those in Damascus and those in Jerusalem and all of Judea, I preach that you should repent, listen y'all, and turn to God and demonstrate your repentance by your deeds. In other words, repentance comes first. And then the Holy Spirit instructs and, 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 and trains us in deeds that God has prepared for us to do. But we've got to humble ourselves first. What Daniel is saying is, if you'll get serious, Nebuchadnezzar, about worshiping God, if you'll get serious about your relationship with God, then He'll do some mighty things through you. Now that's a message for us today. Isn't it? If I'll get serious about my relationship with God, I say you're getting pretty serious today. You're sitting in here at 45 degrees. I think y'all are pretty serious, to be honest with you. But if I get serious about my relationship with God, and I start praying for you, and I start studying the Bible, and I start hanging out with like minded people, and I start developing my relationship with God, I talk to Him, He talks to me. If I get serious about this thing, He can do mighty things through you, Nebuchadnezzar. He'll even give you your kingdom back. Anyway, interesting. So, <laughs> look at Daniel chapter 4, verse 28. Did Nebuchadnezzar listen? No, he didn't. Look at verse 28. All of this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 29. Look at Daniel 4, 29. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on his roof of his royal palace in Babylon, he had twelve months to get himself together. He had twelve months to humble himself. He had 12 months 
to quit thinking about himself and start thinking about his... He had 12 months to turn his eyes towards the most heaven, the most high. 12 months later, as King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 29, walking on the roof of the palace, he said, hey, you, know, you got to love this guy. Hey, look, you don't point your fingers at this guy. This guy would fit in in the 21st century, baby. Now, this would be a 21st century. Guy's picture would be on Cosmopolitan or whatever. Esquire, he'd be the dude, right? I mean, listen to what he said. Verse 30. Is not this my great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my power and for my glory? He's probably in the background. He's got Frank Sinatra playing I've lived a life. That's full. I've traveled each and every, don't worry, I'm not going to sing, each and every highway. But more, much more than this, I did it what? My way, baby. He's got that playing on the, on the record player in the background. He's listening to Frank Sinatra. By my way. But Nebuchadnezzar, you have 12 months to humble yourself. Acknowledge the Most High. You and I, Nebuchadnezzar, all born in the same worldview. Until the Holy Spirit changes. Everybody's worldview before you come to know Christ is this. It's all about me. If you don't believe that, talk to some kindergartners. <laughs> you know what I'm I'm just telling you. I love it. We got a kinder right here. Really. I see her every day. But if you go talk to kinders, you know, it's kind of worth they're in their own little world. You know, they're just spirited now. But you and I were born the same way, running away from God and running towards myself. It's all about me. See, you and I, Nebuchadnezzar, are very similar in that. He had 12 months to change his life. He had 12 months to repent. Now, repentance doesn't just mean I feel sorry. Now, there is sorry in repentance, I guess. I feel sorry. I got caught. That's what the kids, that's what the kids tell me in my office. I'm working a little school, and I'm the discipline guy. They come in. They really feel bad that they got caught. Anyway, uh, but repentance is more than feeling sorry. Repentance means that I'm going this way, now I'm going that way. There's a change of heart, mind, and direction. And all he had to do was, well, was to repent. Think about, I thought about this, think about all the things that had to happen for you to come to know Christ. Think about all the people you had in your life, the, 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 the the events that God set up for you to know Jesus. The people that He sent to you. I thought about that a lot this week as we talk about our story. So Nebuchadnezzar had 12 months. Hey, God in His mercy sent him a dream that disturbed him. In God's mercy, He sent Daniel to instruct him. In 12, he had 12 months to turn. Kindness, Romans 2, 4. Do you not show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Think about yourself. God, through His Holy Spirit, has called you to Him through His Word. He's reached you through the Gospel at your church or wherever you study the Bible. In His mercy, He's preserved your life and prolonged your days so that you can come to know Him and love Him and believe Him. If you know Him and love Him and believe in Him and accept Him today, that's because of God's kindness. So that you would humble yourself to fall down in submission to Jesus Christ and His saving power. Psalm 136 says, His mercy endures forever. God's kindness leads us to repentance. Nebuchadnezzar had 12 months, had a dream, had Daniel, God's kindness. Look at verse 31. Let's see what happens. Even as the words were on his lips, Frank Sinatra playing in the background, look at what all I've done. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what I have decreed to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your, your royal authority has been taken away from you. Verse 32. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox. Seven times will pass by. Seven years will go by until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth and gives it to anyone who wishes. Listen, who's listening? Who's reading this? 
the exiles who are in Babylon, they're reading it for the first time, and, and they're starting to feel hope because God is in control of what's going on, even though it doesn't look like he is, right? Look at verse 33. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people, and they grasped like an ox. His body was drenched to the field of heaven until his hair grew like feathers of an eagle, and his nails like the claws of a bird. Teenagers would be walking home from school. And they'd say, what is up with that dude? Oh, you don't know about him? He used to be the he, he used to be president of all this place. He ran this whole place that got out there. That guy just lost his mind. That ha now has the mind of an animal. Think about that, y'all. Think about the mind of an animal. Think about worldviews and the mind of an animal. And I know how much you love to go to the fevers and all from the dogs. I love them too, you know, I love, love little doggies and all. But listen, you know what they think about? When are they going to get to eat? When are they going to get to go outside and do their business? When are they going to get to lay down and take a nap? But dogs and little cats and stuff, I know you think, well, they think about me too. Well, maybe they do. Especially when you come with the dog, with the dog, they really think about you then. But animals, their worldview is what? Me and my needs and what I'm doing. So God has allowed, and you may see that in the world today, that people have just totally walked away from God, and God gives them over to be like animals, right? So Nebuchadnezzar is in. He's, he's out there eating grass for seven years. Like an animal. So we could see God allow him to become like an animal because he does not acknowledge who he is. Right? Uh -oh. <laughs> All right, let's see what happens here. So all of this happened. Immediately had all of it, it was fulfilled. He was driven away. Now, look at verse 34. We're going to start to get into this here. We're almost finished, y'all. At the end of that time, at the end of that time, I, now we're back to Nebuchadnezzar telling the story. We go from first person to third person back to first person. I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was Restored, then I praise the Most High. I honor and glorify Him who lives forever. And He writes His great doxology. His dominion is eternal. His kingdom endures from generate. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as something He does as He pleases. When did Nebuchadnezzar, when He turned His eyes towards heaven, the eyes that had only really looked at himself and what he had done. But the Bible says, this is important for you and me and someone who might be listening, until we turn our eyes towards heaven and humble ourselves, we're heading down a dead end road, y'all. We can learn that from 600 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar lifted his eyes to heaven. Something that was strange for him. He had never looked anywhere else but at it in the mirror at himself. Until he looked to heaven and humbled himself before the living God. We come to faith in Christ when, he, when we come crawling on our knees just like Nebuchadnezzar. Until we humble ourselves, we're lost. Think about all the things that had to happen in your life for you to come to know Christ. All the situations and events that had to line up perfectly for you to hear the gospel, believe, and then humble yourself. If you've done that, if you haven't done that, then your worldview is this. I was born by, I was born by chance. I lived with no purpose. And when I die, I just go to the living. That's the worldview of a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ. But the worldview for me and you, if we know Jesus Christ, is this. I was born for a reason. I was shaped in my mother's womb. God knitted me together in my mother's womb. He knitted me together just the way I am for a purpose that He made it. He's got an advance for me to do. He threw me in this world. He chased me down. God chased me down. I was running too. How about you? I was running. He chased me down and he said, not here. Pow! It's true. 
Believe. Repent and believe. And then he starts that. And see, that's just it, y'all. Sometimes, and I'm, I'm going to finish with this and pray. Sometimes, now talking to kids, they, we talk about salvation. They think their salvation is all about them. I'm saved. I'm saved. That's right. But your salvation is not about you. Your salvation is about Him. Your salvation comes to you so that you can glorify Him. See, it's still not about us. It's about how He uses us in His plan. Now, do we get some, do we get some benefits of that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what heaven's going to be like, but we get to be there, right? That's a benefit, isn't it? And abundant life now. So I would say to you, you may know someone that needs to hear that in chapter 4. Humble yourself. Until we humble ourselves and lift our eyes to heaven and believe that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And this life is a life of futility. It means nothing. Let's pray together. Lord Father, we come before you today and we thank you and praise you and honor you and glorify you. Lord Father, we come to, to you today in a humble posture. We humble ourselves before you. Because without you, we have nothing. We are nothing. Light means nothing. Without you, Lord, nothing. We're just like that Beatles song, going nowhere, writing songs for nothing, for nobody. It doesn't have any meaning without you. And Lord Father, I pray that those who may hear this today, or those who are here who don't know you, would turn like Nebuchadnezzar did and lift their eyes towards heaven so that we can really start to understand what life's all about. We praise you and honor you for that. Lord, as we enter this Palm Sunday next Sunday, as we enter into these high holy days of the resurrection, Lord Father, speak to us. And we give you the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.